We're looking at the book of Matthew. Uh, so what did you find interesting as you looked at the overview of the book of Matthew and the whole, uh, is Matthew presenting Jesus as a new Moses? What did you find interesting about that uh, as you went through it? Abigail? Uh, I enjoyed doing the question where it was comparing and contrasting Jesus and Moses. And, and Go um, on. I, I enjoyed um, it because they have a lot of similarities, but then they're also very different. Like They're both destined to be leaders of their people to bring them out of a slavery. Um, but Moses is the giver of the law, whereas Jesus is the one that um, was the perfect sacrifice to do away with the law. Right. So let, let's start with similarities. How is Jesus similar to Moses? How is Moses similar to Jesus uh, in Matthew? What, what things just kind of jump out uh, of the, uh, from the page uh, to you? Uh, Alex? They were both born uh, under threat of their lives. Right. So they're both, uh, Matthew's the only one to tell us about Herod's attempt uh, to kill all the children. Uh, and when you look at that, you realize, well, that's exactly what Moses faced. Uh, Moses was the deliverer, God's deliverer. Uh, the king, uh, king of Egypt, Pharaoh, um, uh, decided to uh, kill um, all those people, and yet God intervened. Um, and so we, we have this connection then between uh, Moses and Jesus in terms of their birth. What else uh, in terms of connections between uh, Moses and Jesus? What, what do you... What do you see? Yes, Becca. It's really interesting that Moses was the one who brought the law to the people and Jesus was the one who fulfilled the law. Right, Moses brought the law. Um, Jesus fulfilled the law. Uh, what do you recognize about Moses' effectiveness? in terms of bringing people back to the Garden of Eden. It's very fleeting. We see a lot of, not just this, this literal deliverance of um, the people from Egypt as slaves, but a lot of uh, scripture talks about us being like a slave to sin. Um, and so under Moses' law, it was very much, you know, they were out of Egypt, they were still not in that slavery, and like under the rules of yeah, they had a law, um, but that law, I mean, does Moses keep the law or does Moses break the law? Moses breaks the law, and how many times does he break the law before God tells him you can't go in the promised land? Once. Uh, to get in the promised land uh, based on the law, requires perfect obedience. Moses is not perfectly obedient, and therefore Moses can't go in the promised land. And uh, some people, when they're looking at the Pentateuch, will even point out that Moses may be contrasting himself as a lawgiver um, who fails to get the people in with Abraham, who is Abraham a, a sinful person in the story? Does he have issues and problems? And yet, does he get to walk around in the promised land? And does he free? He does. And so there's this tension. John Salhammer in his uh, work on the Pentateuch will point out that even Moses is bringing out this uh, tension that he as the lawgiver can't get people into the promised land but there's going to be someone else in a different covenant, a uh, covenant of grace, a covenant based on belief uh, that 
will get people in. Uh, what else do you notice in terms of just uh, uh, Moses? What can you tell me about Moses' birth and the legitimacy of Moses' birth uh, and Jesus' birth? What can, what can you tell me about that? They were like in somewhere that's not really worthy for for all the deep corn and manger and all that. Well, I guess he wasn't born in a basket, but like he was put in a basket. Yeah, I th- um, Mac, I think you're thinking rightly there. Do you know who Moses' father is? Amram, uh, do you know who Amram was married to? Jochebed, who is Amram's aunt. Is that a legal marriage based on Leviticus 18? Now, I realize that Leviticus 18 isn't in effect when Amram marries uh, but neither was the law, thou shalt not murder. Uh, that doesn't come until later. Um, Amram and Jochebed's marriage, if that had occurred under the Mosaic law, would have disqualified um, both of them. I think they would have both been stoned. And if Amram and Jochebed had been stoned, would Moses have ever been born? Is there anything else that would disqualify Moses um, in terms of being an effective leader for the people of God? If you were a lawyer making a case against Moses, uh, Alex? Um, He was not circumcised on the eighth day. uh, He was not circumcised on the eighth day. he, I think how I would say that, he, he did not circumcise his own sons. Uh, maybe he was circumcised, we, we don't know, but clearly he didn't circumcise his sons. Well, we see later on in Exodus that Moses was circumcised as an adult. No? You, you may be right. I know Abraham circumcised as an adult, but for some, and I know Moses' children weren't circumcised. Uh, and God almost kills him over it. Um, did Moses do anything? that under the Mosaic law would disqualify him from living. He killed someone. And do you recall in this story what he does before he kills the person? It tells us. He looks right and looks left, and then he strikes down the Egyptian. Now Moses is the one who uh, gives us the law where you can flee to a city of refuge if you accidentally kill someone. Um, But uh, in that law, Moses says uh, that's for an unpremeditated, you know, you're doing something, you accidentally kill someone else, you can flee. But Moses, uh, revealing God's will, says, if you premeditatedly murder someone, you can't flee, you die. And Moses had premeditatedly murdered someone. Uh, Morgan? Well, wasn't that not self-defense? Wasn't he defending the other man that the, that the Egyptian was eating? He was. And so h- help me with that, Morgan. Um, let's see. Like if you were Moses' lawyer, and you were pleading Moses' case, what would you say? That the Egyptian was eating the Hebrew, and Moses stepped in to save the other man. So who would lead to save the other man's life? 
and you're making the best case you can for that. Uh, what if the counter attorney would say, so it was right for him to kill him? The guy was beating, uh, so that justified? And when you look right and look left before you do something, why are you looking right and looking left? to see if anyone's watching. Now, let me just ask you, Morgan, and ask everyone, when you do something righteous, do you want other people to see you do that righteous thing? Yeah. And when you, uh, not speaking of you, but uh, us in general, if you're doing something you don't want someone else to see, is that usually you're doing a right thing or a wrong thing? A wrong thing. So the fact that he's wanting to hide it, um, even under modern law, would be proof that he knows there's something wrong. Now, Morgan, could you spin it away and say, well, maybe he was hoping blank? I mean, as an original prince of having raised, so people would look at him and think, you know, him killing an Egyptian slave is Hebrew slave. Yeah. Stephen gives us an insight what Moses may have been thinking when he says Moses thought that they would realize that he was the Redeemer. So he thought, it seems to me that Stephen is saying Moses thought that when he killed the Egyptian that they would realize he was the God. Is that the way God normally works? If we're really putting Moses on trial here, couldn't he have tried something less extreme than murder first? Yeah, <laughs> like talk, <laughs> I mean, you know? Uh, really? <laughs> guys, uh, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, for, uh, it's like when you strike down, it, it's, would, would you grant it's kind of like that uh, rape of Dinah story where, you know, you have this horrible rape that happened and so what's Levi's solution to that? Kill let's kill everything that moves. And since all their wives are widows now, let's marry their wives. That seems a little much. I mean, uh, the rape of Dinah was horrible. But is the murder of everybody in the town, is that justice? Maybe you could argue somehow they're complicit but that it seems like the the retaliation is much worse than or uh, as worse uh, as as the act in uh, against Dinah so you got a problem there uh, does Moses perfectly obey God's law when God tells him to do something with a rock. Uh, do you re recall that story? Um, we should look at this. Um, I've got 10,000 things open. That's not a good uh, thing. If I don't crash my computer. Um, so this is what God tells him. This is Yahweh. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. And you will strike the rock. Now, help me with that. If God's standing on the rock, and Moses strikes the rock, what does it look like Moses is doing to Yahweh? It looks like he's striking God. Now, let me just ask, if you're Moses and, and God tells you, uh, take that stick and just smack the daylights out of me, what are you going to say as Moses? Maybe not. I mean, you're going to do what God tells you to do, but... It's like, 
people striking God usually doesn't, that usually doesn't turn out very well. Uh, Gloriana? I was just going to ask, when it says there that I will stand before you on the rock at Horeb, is that rock necessarily the one that Moses was striking? Because sometimes they would refer to rock at a mountain to be just another big rock or the mountain itself. So is it necessarily saying that Jesus was standing on the same rock that he was striking? Um, so we get help, right? Have you ever taken like a math class or something and done the homework and, and you think you've done the homework right? What do you do when you think you've done it right? What do you always check? You always check the answers in the back of the book, right? Should we do that? Because the New Testament references this event. Well, Bob Works is making a liar out of me. Uh, yeah, uh, first. Uh, Corinthians 10.4. They all drank from the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Help me with the meta narrative. Why in the world would Yahweh want Christ struck? By Moses. Right. Jonah? I mean, when Jesus was crucified, he was struck, and then when he was, once he was dead, they pushed him aside and water and he fell. Uh, he that, that's, a, that's exactly right. And we have this uh, passage, 521 For our sake, he, that is God, made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Was Jesus struck by the Mosaic law? Yeah, Jesus has become one flesh with his bride. Her sins have become his sins. Why would God want Yahweh struck? Why would God want that? Could it be that it's pointing forward to the meta narrative? Now, the second time they need water, what does God tell Moses to do? Tells him to speak to the rock. Um, we, we should look at... Um, So 17.6 is the first one. They drank uh, Yahweh standing before. But the second one is Numbers 20. So this is years later. Um, God tells him to speak to the rock. But he doesn't speak to it. He strikes the rock. Now, if you're Moses, what might be running through your mind? God told you to strike the rock. Yahweh is there. He does it. Water comes out. Years later, he says, okay, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. Why is Moses, why wouldn't Moses do that, would you think? Moses is thinking, um, my way is better. My way is better. And uh, it's a it pride issue as well. I think he was worried that the Israelites, the people he was leading, were going to look at him and go, that uh, guy's crazy. That guy's crazy. He's talking to a rock. Also, he, it, from verse 10, he is very angry again. <laughs> He's angry at people. Moses gets really angry at Israel because they break God's law. Yeah, he does end up getting 
He goes and does it himself. And isn't that us? Is, is there ever a particular sin you struggle with, like if you struggle with pride or something, and then you get around somebody who's just really full of themselves and like you can just see it? And doesn't that just like send you through the roof? It's like all the while, you know, you're struggling with pride, but when you get around somebody else, who, like you can see it clearer and it like ticks you off a little bit. You wonder if that isn't Moses. Um, what what else do you find interesting about Matthew, the overview of Matthew? What did you make of this whole um, uh, this whole thing in Matthew? So this is what it is in in Greek. I'm just going to say search for that um, phrase, and we'll get all the results. We'll do the results in English. Uh, but these are all verbatim, the exactly the same thing. When Jesus finished these sayings, when Jesus had finished, now that's a little unfortunate in English, they're making that different, but in Greek, they're exactly the same. When Jesus finished, 13... Uh, 53, when Jesus had finished. 19, 1, when Jesus had finished. 21, 1, when Jesus finished. And you can see that all five of those are the exact same phrase in Greek. Kai, agenita, hate, etelesen, ha, yesus. Verbatim, all five times. So, what do you make of that? What do you find interesting, confusing, wonder about? Um, uh, Becca? I have a question because I don't know how close the Greek is, but my first thought was uh, like it's not the same as Greek. It's different. The Greek there is uh, different. That's in John, but it's the same verb. Um, um, do you know that different people have different names for the Bible? Do you know that? Like if we were Germans, it wouldn't be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. It would be Moses 1, Moses 2, Moses 3, Moses 4, Moses 5. Uh, have you heard those books called the Pentateuch before? The Torah. the Torah. So it's like five sections of one book. Okay, help me. Why, why might Matthew be dividing Gloriana? Well, I was just going to say Matthew is, he, well, obviously he's a Jew, right? But he's known for trying to correlate Jesus' life with the fulfillment of prophecy. He's known for writing his book specifically to the Jews and helping the Jews see it. Most, the most Jewish of all the Gospels. So he may be trying to incorporate that into the division into five sections into his book to give a relatability to the Jews. Just as Moses divided his into five, Matthew's dividing Jesus's into five. I could buy that. Uh, where was Moses when he gave the law to Israel? Anybody else give law on top of a mountain anywhere? Oh, Jesus gave law on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Moses delivered the people on what Jewish holiday? And Jesus died on the cross. Oh, okay. So maybe, maybe Matthew is saying that this whole thing is like meta narrative elegance. Like, um, 
Oh, can I show you another one? Um, uh, all right, let me ask you a question. Um, how many of you like uh, the places in the Bible like where there are genealogies? Like you, you open your Bible up and like there's a genealogy and you're just kind of like, yes, I am so glad I get to have my quiet time today in the genealogy. I just appreciate your honesty. Uh, we, we, we skip it, don't we? I mean, it's like, okay, I just don't get this. Can I show you something weird in the Bible? Um, that becomes like incredibly beautiful. Um, so 13 times in the Old Testament, there's this, uh, there's this weird phrase in Hebrew, and it's called Eleh Toledoth. These are the generations of blank. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. These are the generations of Adam, Noah, Shem, Shem again, Terah, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Esau again, Jacob, Aaron, Perez, 13 times in the Old Testament. What do you notice about those 13 times? Ella Toledoth. Is the number 13 a happy number, or is it, like, maybe not that great a number? How does it strike you? Uh, do you remember how we uh, talked about last time? Um, and I apologize for the four-minute rushed um, thing. Um, but we were talking about words and weird words and numbers, and there was a word. What was the word we used? <coughs> Gematria. And uh, so for four minutes, I talked gibberish, right? And you thought, that guy is out of his mind, right? <laughs> well, it turns out uh, Gematria is a real thing. It's a Jewish thing. And this is the table in Greek and Hebrew. So these are the values, right? And um, I, I've got a concordance in my office. Um, it used to be the concordance before the days of computer when we actually had to use books to look things up. Uh, I had a, a Hebrew concordance that the numbers of it were written in Gematria. So you would look at the whole thing's in Hebrew, the book names, everything, and the numbers are in Gematria. And I can't tell you, I think I've still got that course in my office. It's fallen apart. I use it so much. I can't tell you how many times I stood there with that concordance and on my fingers would say, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zion, Het. Het, eight. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dot, He, Vav, Zion, Het, Tet, Yud. Kop, Lamed, 30, 38. I, if I've done that once, I've done it who knows how many times. Because it's written in Gematria. Okay, and I know what you're saying. You're saying, like, okay, where in the world is that going? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because uh, that's weird. Um, this is the word David in Hebrew. D V D. You with me?
Tell me what Tell me what the numeric value in Hebrew would be of DVD based on this chart. What what is the D's? What are the D's worth? The dollars? Four. And what are the V's worth? The wows or the vavs? Six. So these are not digitized. They're you just add them together. So what's the numeric value of David's name? Fourteen. And what does Matthew say in chapter one? How many people are there from Abraham to fourteen? And how many are there from David to the Babylonian captivity? And how many are there from the Babylonian captivity to Jesus? Fourteen. And remind me, how many Toledotes are there in the Old Testament? Eli Toledoth? Oh man, if we just could have one more Toledoth. So, I don't know. That's kind of what it looks like in Hebrew. That's kind of a mess, isn't it? This is the word Ella, and you can see this is the word Toledoth. You want to see what that looks like in Greek? Now that's much friendlier, isn't it? This is the Biblos, the Biblos of the Gennesos of heaven and earth, of mankind, of Noah, Shem, Terah, right? Look at the start of Matthew. This is the Biblos of the Gennesaos of Jesu Christi. How does Matthew start his gospel? He starts it with the 14th Toledoth of the Bible. Now, um, you might ask the question, well, what in the world does Toledoth mean? What, what does the word, like, what does the word Toledoth mean? I'm really glad you asked. Okay, so uh, Toledoth in Hebrew is related to the verb yelled. If you ever take Hebrew, this is how you remember what yelled means. When a woman has a baby, she yells, right? So what does yelled mean in Hebrew? It's having a baby, right? So if that's what the root means, what is toledoth? Toledoth is like the process of having a baby. So the way all 13 of these Toledos work in the Old Testament is you have somebody introduced and a fact is given about their lives. And then the Toledoth tells you what that fact did. Think of Noah. Noah found grace in God's eyes. This is the Ella Toledoth. Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generation. Was Noah actually perfect? Is he conquered by the fruit of, and does he get naked? That sounds like something to me. So if somebody's conquered by fruit, they're naked. Oh, Adam. Oh, Noah is like a second Adam. Does he succeed? He fails. But... Noah finds grace in God's eyes. And believe it or not, I know this is New Testament class. I know that's hard for you. But do you know the word uh, in Hebrew, the word Noah? 
is this word. So that's the end, and this is like a sound, no, Noah. Noah found grace in God's eyes. Do you know what that is? It's the end. Noah found the opposite of Noah. Noah found grace. Noah, Noah found the exact opposite of what he deserved from God. And what did that produce in his life? Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generation. And you say, God, he wasn't really perfect. And God says, no, I declare him perfect. This is what grace produces. And then you realize that's the meta narrative of all of us, isn't it? That God comes to something that's dead, dark, without form and void, darkness, under the waters of judgment, and God says, let there be light. And when God says, let there be light, God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. That's what he's doing in our lives. Okay, so that's how the Toledoth works. When two people are given, who's introduced first, the bad one or the good one? In this list. Ishmael, Isaac. Esau, Jacob. The bad one. So you only have one line of priest, and you only have one line that's a king. So are those good kings and good priests? And then you realize that Jesus is the perfect prophet, priest, and king. You realize, and do you see the similarity here, the book of the generations, the book of, this is Adam, this is Jesus as the second Adam? Matthew is giving us uh, all of that. So he's saying uh, all of it is coming together uh, in Jesus. Now, in the time that we have left, what did you find interesting about the Sermon on the Mount? So if this is like a Jewish gospel. This is, um, you know... Say, so read it in light of, of what's uh, in the past. What struck you as you worked through the Sermon on the Mount? Tell me your name again. Laura. Laura. Um, I thought it was interesting that he laid out all of these, all of these guidelines for a, a righteous Christian's life, and then immediately afterwards turned to Matthew, the tax collector, who probably was one of the ones who fulfilled any of these requirements. Right. Um, I think it's an interesting picture of the new covenant. Help me with that, Laura. Um, I think, um, you know, Christ even said himself he came to call not the righteous but sinners. Sinners. Um, and I, he's he's laying out in very clear terms that no one is going to be able to live to these live up to these right. standards, but they're still going to be accepted by him anyway. Yeah. What counts for murder? If you dishonor someone else, you've murdered them. Mm -hmm. uh, what counts for uh, adultery? Lustful thought. If you had one lustful thought, you've committed adultery. And then Jesus flips it, and it's not only adultery. If you live your life in a way that makes somebody else have a lustful thought, then you violated the command because you fostered adultery in their heart. So if that's how Jesus is interpreting the law, he's lived up to the law. Nobody. But does Jesus say in this sermon, you must be, right? if it doesn't, uh, more than the Russian Pharisees, you're not getting in, but he says, you must be blank as your heavenly father is blank. What does he say? Perfect. Okay, so I want to do a little experiment now. Uh, you, you know what the Ten Commandments are? Five of them about man, five of them about God. They're in order. Don't kill. Don't uh, 
commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, uh, don't covet. You see they're kind of in order. Uh, summarize all of them, love other people the same way you love yourself. These, uh, no other gods, uh, no idols, don't take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and then kind of a principle, just like this one's a principle, honor your father and mother because God's the one who put you in the family. All right? Jesus said, be perfect. Okay, so I want to try a little experiment. So for the next 10 seconds, we're not going to break the Ten Commandments, okay? All right, so five, four, three, two, one, go. Okay, done. Did you break the Ten Commandments? Because God wanted you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And while you were doing that, to be so in love with everybody else on the planet that you are thinking about their well-being as much as you are thinking about your own. So how would you do over the five seconds? I'm going to hell. I'm going straight to hell. I'm not going to pass go. I'm not going to collect two hundred dollars. <laughs> it's like if you're called to live to the standard, that standard of the law, every single one of us breaks the Ten Commandments every single day in thought, word, and deed, because we don't love God with everything we've got, and we don't love other people with everything we've got. But Jesus said you've got to be perfect. So could we pull off five seconds? I don't know about you, I couldn't. And to get in based on the law, you've got to never break it. You've got to take that five seconds and extend it in both directions forever. And it's like, I'm, I'm just under the judgment of God. And that's why Jesus' sermon is so beautiful. And this is, I love the Greek of this. Blessed, and then this word, toikoi, there are several words uh, in Greek for being poor. This is the abject poverty. This is where you don't have two spiritual nickels to rub together. How would you translate that if you were trying to, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, blessed are the spiritually destitute, blessed are the spiritual homeless people, blessed are, blessed are those who don't have anything to recommend them to God. That's how Jesus starts. But then he says, to get in, you've got to have perfect obedience. And here's how Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus lived under, did Jesus love the Lord his God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, all his strength? Did Jesus love every single person on the planet the same way he loved himself? What's he doing is he's being tortured naked on the cross over six hours in front of hundreds of people. What was he doing during that uh, six hours of being tortured? What was he verbally doing? He's praying for their well-being. Did Jesus fulfill the Mosaic law? Absolutely. When you get married, when God made marriage, he, had, he described it in a way in Genesis. He said the two will become one flesh. The two people will be counted as one person. Okay. And is the church married to Christ? Is the church one flesh with Christ? If the church is one flesh with Christ... And Christ is perfectly obedient. What does that mean about the church? We're perfectly obedient. But you say, well, now if you do it that way, it means that the church's sins 
become Christ's sins, right? And isn't that exactly what Paul said? God made him who knew no sin to be sin? Did God fully punish sin on the cross? If the two are one flesh, does God have any more wrath against the sin of the church? No. How do you get in heaven? You get into heaven on the basis of the perfection of the new super Moses. And we didn't look at it, but do you know that Jesus' name in Greek means something? You know how all the names in the Bible mean something? Okay. Uh, what does Jesus' name in Greek mean? Jo jo Yahweh of salvation, Joshua. How far can Moses get the people? He can get them to Abel Shatim, the field of thorns, until this really cool guy named Yeshua comes along. And Yeshua can take them out of the field of thorns into the land flowing with milk and honey. It's a picture, a foreshadowing of what Jesus did for us. Hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday.